I'm going to ask you to turn with me to 2 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. As I mentioned before, and I say it again, that the subject of the return of Jesus Christ is very unpopular in the Orthodox churches. There are very few, if any, priests or bishops that preach about the second coming. And if they do, it's only in passing, casually. But they will not dwell on it as a main message. Here in chapter 2, the Apostle Paul uh, is speaking about what is to come. He's predicting and foretelling concerning the return of Jesus and particularly describing the circumstances under which Jesus will return and what will transpire just prior to the coming of Jesus. And he says in verse 3, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first and that men of sin be revealed the son of perdition because there were some Christians at that time who believed that Jesus was going to come any day. His return was imminent. The early Christians believed in the very soon return of Jesus. But Paul said, no, Jesus will not come until the apostasia takes place. That's what falling away means. The Greek word there is apostasia. What does apostasia mean? Falling away from the faith. In other words, uh, backsliding, backsliding and uh, falling into spiritual complacency and compromising the gospel and uh, going uh, away from Christ and looking for uh, idols. Like uh, Jesus said to the church of Ephesus, you have left your first love. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. That's the Antichrist. So before Jesus comes, who will appear first? The man of sin. Oanthropos Samartinus. The Antichrist will come first. And the Apostle Paul describes the Antichrist, who he'll be. And he's going to be an individual. He's not going to be some system like some preach today. He's going to be an individual. Because what does Antichrist mean? Instead of Christ, Andi Christos. doesn't mean against Christ. It means in, in, instead of Christ. So uh, what are we expecting to see? What are we expecting to see before the coming of Christ? A lot of Christ substitutes. Men will rise and they'll claim to be the ones that will fulfill the purpose of the Messiah. They'll claim to have a mess messianic calling. And they'll try to be a, a substitute, to do what Jesus is doing. And what does Jesus want to do ultimately for the world? To bring what? Peace to the world. Because the Bible says Christ is our peace. He's called the Prince of Peace. There is no peace apart from Christ. And yet... What is the world trying to do today? To establish peace among the nations. And look at what's going on in the Middle East between the Arabs and the Jews. Uh, with, they're trying to bring peace without Christ. Like the Bible says, when they shall say, peace, peace, suddenly cometh the destruction. And then the Apostle Paul says, this Antichrist opposes and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. So this uh, Antichrist will try to take the place of God. Very simple. Not much, nothing profound about it. Very simple. And uh, then... Uh, he says in verse 5, verse five. Remember you not that when I was yet with you I told you these things? So what is Paul doing here? He's simply reminding the Thessalonians of what he already preached to them when he was in Thessalonica. And now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. In other words, uh, withholdeth. In other words, the Holy Spirit is uh, 
restraining Satan from coming from the, uh, into the world in the person of uh, the Antichrist. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Now this is what I want to dwell on a little bit uh, at length here. The mystery of, of iniquity. In other words, what is the mystery of iniquity? Well, mystery of iniquity is the work of Satan. And it's called a mystery because it's uh, something that was unknown of. And now he's revealing it for the first time. He's revealing this, uh, this truth that was not known before to the Christian believers. To Mysterion Sonomias. And this Mysterion Sonomias is none other than Satan's program for the end of the age. Satan has his program just as God has his program for the end of the age, for the close, for the close of the age. And the church was founded on the day of Pente Pentecost. Is that right? The day of Pentecost. Well, how many of you know that Satan had his, had his Pentecost too? And because what's the pattern of Satan? He mimics whatever Christ does. He duplicates. He tries to uh, to do what Christ does. He cannot create anything of his own, so he counterfeits what is genuine. So what Paul is saying is that while God established his program at, on the day of Pentecost, Satan also had his had his program established. The mystery of iniquity. In other words, the program of the Antichrist. And what's the program of the Antichrist? To win the universal worship of mankind. Why did Satan fall to begin with? What was he after? He wanted to ascend, the Bible tells us, to the heights of, of the Godhead. He wanted to be equal with God, and then he fell. Well, since he fell, he didn't give up. And he's still at it ever from that time, from the time of his fall from heaven. But now he's using this instrument, the Antichrist, to win the universal. This is his big dream to have everybody in the world worship him as God. And he's working at it. Because Paul says, uh, doth already work. It's already working. What's working? The plan of the Antichrist. In other words, to do what Christ is trying to do, he's competing with Christ in a sense, okay? He's rivaling Christ. And there's a corresponding program in Satan's mind to win the allegiance of mankind, to set up his kingdom and to dislodge the kingdom and the sovereign plan of God for humanity, to thwart the ultimate purposes of God for humanity. And this is very real. It's not something symbolic or it's not an allegory. But Paul says it's already working. In other words, the Antichrist was working in the days of St. Paul. How many years was that after Christ? In the 60s maybe? He was writing this epistle. Imagine. The mystery of iniquity started in the days of St. Paul. The program of Saint was unfolding. Think of what has happened after 2,000 years, how far the program of Saint has unfolded. Think of it. If he says the mystery of iniquity doth already work, well, how much more is it working today in our own day? The work of the Antichrist. And when I say Antichrist, I'm not talking about looking around in the world for some political leader, although he very likely will be a, a political world leader, dictator. But the Apostle John tells us in his epistles, the Antichrist is coming and there are many, he says what, Antichrists. He uses it in the plural. 
Now, what does he mean by there are many kepoli and seen? Many antichrists. Who are these many antichrists? They are the forerunners of the one supreme antichrist. They are preparing the way for the one unique antichrist. He's setting, they're setting the stage. They're preparing the hearts of whom? Not out in the world, but inside the churches today. That's why St. John Chrysostom says the Antichrist will be seated not only in the temple of Jerusalem, but in every church there will be a, the Antichrist will be seated. In other words, inside the churches today, Catholic, uh, Protestant, Orthodox, Satan is doing his work in a very subtle way. He's trying to prevail and trying to uh, pretend that he's what? The Messiah. Very simple. You know, Satan has changed his tactics. He's not persecuting Christians like he did the first three centuries. But he's trying to work inside the church now, through the structures of the church, through the clergy, through those that, that want to play God in the church. We have plenty of them, don't we? Those that want to play God in the church are antichrists. Brother Mito Antichristo. Because they want, to play, they want to take the place of Christ. In other words, they draw attention not to the Lord Jesus Christ, but they draw attention to whom? To themselves. And there's no greater abomination than to draw attention to yourself to uh, enhance your own personal ambition, your thirst for power and authority, and to do it. Fine, you want to do it? Fine but not in the name of the name which is above every name. I mean, there's no greater abomination. That's why those men that do that in the church today have a frightful account to give to the Lord someday. Because they are abusing that precious name for their own, what? Selfish aims. To enhance their own prestige in the institution which is called the Church of Christ. Men that like to appeal to Christ for what? To enhance their own what? Their authority in the church. And who play God. This is frightful. Because Saint, that's why St. John the Baptist said, I must decrease, John Baptist said, and he must <coughs> increase you know what the antidote is to the Antichrist spirit? The spirit of St. John the Baptist. That's the antidote, the preventative in the church. We must decrease, humble ourselves so that Jesus may be increased. He might be exalted. He cannot be exalted until the rest of us are humbled. Until we priests and bishops and patriarchs take a back seat and say, Jesus, this is your church, not mine. Take it over. Run this church, Jesus. I want to be your, your slave, your servant, Lord, to humble ourselves before the Lord, to submit to him. And truly, as Paul says, that the church be subject to Christ, but it's no longer subject to Christ. It's subject to what? To men. I'm not saying this simply to be critical or malicious. Or vindictive? No. But I've lived it for 29 years. I see the corruption that's working in the church today. We might have the true doctrines. I have no question about it. The true faith, yes. We've got the gospel, but we bury it. We don't want to bring it out because it convicts us. It's not to our interest. It will undermine our prestigious positions. We, we who are men, want to prevail here to rule the Church of Christ. I'll tell you, I feel sorry for these people. They have no idea what's coming for them. Oh, dear Jesus, have mercy on us. Glory to God. They're going to receive a greater judgment than the scribes and Pharisees that were contemporary, because at least the scribes and Pharisees didn't know the truth. When Jesus said, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees. Remember those, the list of woes? 
They never heard them, but, but we know them, we priests and we bishops and patriarchs. And, we're, we're, and, and yet, yet we harden our hearts in the cause of our own self-seeking objectives and aims in our life. So the mystery of iniquity doth already work. That's all it is, very simple. Nothing theologically profound about it. So what's the problem in the Orthodox Church? It's not the doctrines, the liberalism. We've got the true faith, the creeds are all intact, unlike the other churches who are denying the divinity of Christ, they're denying the atoning sacrifice of Christ, denying the resurrection, body resurrection of Jesus, the virgin birth. We have all that. We, are, we say it, we profess it, but we give it only what? Lip service. But thank God at least we got it. That's a good foundation to move on in, for a renewal revival. You know, if we didn't have the doctrinal foundations, that's why I'm glad I'm orthodox. At least I've got the doctrinal foundations for a revival. But when you're denying the divinity of Christ and the atoning sacrifice of Christ, what kind of a revival can you have on that kind of rotten foundation, demonic foundation? You see, that's why the revival in the whole Christian world should by right start where? With the Orthodox Church. That's why they're coming in droves to the Orthodox Church, Anglicans and Catholics and others. Why? They're looking for doctrinal stability. Creedal stability. That's important. In, in spite of all of our evils in our church, we have creedal stability. I'm glad for that. Hallelujah. <coughs> Glory to God. I'm glad for that. But what the evil in our church is not liberalism, it's not theological liberalism, but it's religious formalism. Holding to the form of religion, Paul says, denying the power thereof. Tipolatria, like we say in Greek. Tipopimene orthodoxia. This is the, the evil. St. Paul, oh, he condemned formalism. Considered idolatry. He says you started in the, in the, in the spirit of liberty and now you've ended in, in the spirit of bondage, he says. Formalism is, formalism is bondage. But you see, religious formalism caters to the weakness and infirmities of human nature of those in, in, in authority. It's to their interest. They don't want people to rise above the level of religious informal, uh, formalism. Why? Because then their power, their authority will be what? Threatened. So when I got the baptism of the Holy Spirit in 1972, the first thing I did was to step aside and let Jesus take over. I, I, the Lord stripped me of my prof religious professionalism, of my clerical professionalism that I had picked up from seminary days and from other priests and from the atmosphere around me. I didn't know anything better than what I had back then. And I wasn't worried anymore about, about what they're talking about me, about my losing my good name and my reputation. But I was more concerned now for the reputation of Jesus. Glory to God. So, uh, Satan is at work, and he has his plan, and w the Lord wants us to be alive to this, to be, not, to be, not to be unaware of the program of Satan. I want you to turn with me now to the book of Joel. In the Old Testament, the book of Joel... Here in the prophecy of Joel, we find here a vivid description of what Satan will do to the people of God as, as the close of the age uh, approaches. Here Joel uh, describes the, the, a picture here of God's people. He's referring here to Israel. So the application is a twofold application. It applies to Israel in the Old Testament, but it also applies to the new people of God in the New Covenant. And what do we call the new people of God? The church, the body of Christ. And what 
Joel is uh, bringing out here. Can you bring me another marker? This is losing its thing. Here we have a picture. We have a picture of what we call desolation. Desolation. The Greek word is erimosis, and the word erimia, which means desert. And this is very vivid, and it foretells what's going to happen to Israel, but it also foretells what's going to happen to the Church of Christ. You might say, how could the Church of Christ go through a desolation? After all, isn't the church the body of Christ? How could Jesus allow his church to endure desolation? You know, that always used to bother me. I used to struggle with this question. And I never, in my earlier days, I would never allow anyone to talk about renewal or reform, reforming anything in the church. I said, people need renewal, but not the church. I used to make that false distinction. Why? Because it was insecurity, religious insecurity on my part. I said, if, I, if they pull from under me the props of the church, then I've not, I don't have anything left. I felt threatened spiritually. Why? Because I didn't have a relationship with whom? With Jesus. It was the institutional church that was my, my uh, security. So, uh, here the word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Bethuel. Hear this, ye old men, and give ear, all ye inhabitants of the land. Hath this been in your days, or even in the days of your fathers? Tell ye your children of it, and let your children tell their children and their children another, another generation. Then finally it comes here to the main point, verse 4. That which the palmer, wor palmer worm has left hath a locust eaten. And that which the locust hath left hath a canker worm eaten. And that which the canker worm hath left hath a caterpillar eaten. So what is Joel trying to say is that the people of God are systematically invaded by insects. And what do, who do the insects symbolize? They symbolize the demons, demon powers. I mean, that's a pretty thoroughgoing desolation. I mean, you could, look at all these bugs, these insects here. I mean, after they, they've gone over the, the people of God, there's nothing left. Not even a leaf left. Palmer worm, the locust, the canker worm, the caterpillar. Nothing's left. Desolation. And skip down to verse 7. He has laid my vine waste, embarked my fig tree, he hath made it clean, bare, and cast it away. The branches thereof are made white. He hath laid my vine waste. What does vine symbolize in, in, the, in the Bible usually? It symbolizes the church in the New Testament. And what does the fig tree usually symbolize? It symbolizes Israel, natural Israel. So the vine is wasted and the fig tree is wasted. In other words, the Jewish people who are the people, the chosen people of God, are desolate spiritually. That's why, what did Jesus say to the Jews of his day? Behold, thy house is left. What was the word? Behold, thy house is left desolate. So the word desolation comes from the mouth of Jesus. Behold, your house, what house? The house of Israel. The people of Israel. Erimos. Why? Because they turned their back to their Messiah, the Redeemer. And they invited, they welcomed desolation. So the Jewish people to this day have suffered what? Desolation. Now at the same time, the church is also suffering desolation. As the day of the Lord uh, uh, comes closer and closer. In other words, it's what we read in, in 2 Thessalonians, the mystery of iniquity doth already work. The plan of Satan is unfolding, and Satan is laying waste the church of Christ. And he's sending into the church, what? Insects. What are the insects? Demons. So that's why the church that is infiltrated by agents of Satan. 
I've noticed in my own experience as a pastor for years, there's always a Satan in every church board. I always used to find one. And now they're probably more than what they were back then when I was pastoring churches. Always some troublemaker. Satan sends them in to undermine the work of the priest and the work of, of Jesus Christ. And then I, I skip down to verse 10 with me. The field is wasted. Now here's further description, vivid description. The land mourneth, for the corn is wasted. Corn there usually refer, means wheat in the, in the Old Testament, New Testament. The wheat is wasted, the grain is wasted. In other words, there's no harvest. And the new wine is dried up. There's no wine to gladden the heart of man. The oil languisheth. There's no wine, no oil, no harvest. And then skip down uh, to verse 12, a f further description, very bleak description of God's people. The vine is dried up. Doesn't that remind you of the church today? How many people are withering on the, on the, on the vine today? Because they're not being nourished. The vine is dried up. That's the church. And the fig tree languishes. The Jewish nation languishes now for 2,000 years. They're languishing since, since Jesus died on the cross. Since they condemned Jesus, sentenced him to death. The pomegranate tree, the palm tree also, and the apple tree, even all the trees of the field are withered. Because joy is withered away from the sons of men. There's no joy anymore, even in the church today. You stand where I stand as a priest in, in our churches and you see the depression on people's faces, how sad they look today, our Greek people. Otherwise, lovely people, good family people, but basically dejected. They have no reason to be happy. They don't rejoice. There's no, no joy. The joy is withered away from the sons of men. I feel like telling a lot of, I, tell, I feel like telling our congregation sometimes, Please smile. You're not at a funeral home. We're not at a funeral. We're, we're witnessing the resurrection of Jesus. He rose from the dead. We're, vict we're victorious people. Assume your privileges and the power and the authority God has given you. But who does all this? The insects have invaded the, uh, the field of the Lord. Didn't, didn't the Lord say in the last days uh, iniquity shall multiply? Iniquity shall multiply for the love of many shall wax cold. So some people say things will get better and better. The Bible says things will get worse and worse. The darkness will get darker. In verse 20, skip down to verse 20 because we don't have time to go all, through all the verses. The beasts of the field cry also unto thee, for the rivers of waters are dried up, and the fire hath devoured the pastures of the wilderness. Isn't that something? How terrible the picture is. Oh, glory to God. I mean, to what low level we've really uh, been reduced. We've been reduced to uh, slaves of Satan. He's done a job on us in the churches today. But... You might say, well, yes, but is God still on his throne? Well, I believe, yes, God is still on his throne. Is he still a merciful God? Amen. God is a merciful God. Remember the children of Israel when they went through the, the wilderness on their way to the promised land? How many times God felt like getting rid of them? I mean, they were so stubborn. They gave Moses such a hard time. And yet he always forgave them. And he stepped in and would feed them with manna from heaven and then water from the rock and on and on and on and victory after victory. Well, here's the same God who has pity on his people. Chapter 2, verse 18. Then will the Lord be jealous for his land and pity his people. And in verse... Uh, and before that, uh, verse 12, Therefore also now saith the Lord, Turn even to me with all your heart, 
and with fasting and with weeping and with mourning and rend your heart. What is that? What does that sound like? Repentance. And not your garments and turn unto the Lord your God for he is gracious and merciful. Slow to anger and of great kindness and repenteth him of the evil of the evil. So he's calling his people to repentance. And finally in verse 18, what does God do? He uh, responds to the repentance of his people. And he says, Then will the Lord be jealous for his land and pity his people. Yea, the Lord will answer and say to his people, Behold, I will send you corn, the basic substance, uh, the staple food of man, and wine and oil, and you shall be satisfied therewith, and I will no more make you a reproach among the heathen. Isn't that fantastic? Skip down to verse 23. Be glad, then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain, the first month. And verse, uh, well, and the floors shall be full of wheat, and the vats shall overflow with wine and oil. Doesn't that sound beautiful? What does that sound like? That sounds like prosperity. What does that sound like? What does that sound like? What's the opposite of desolation? Restoration. restoration. Yes. Here's the picture of restoration now. God is behind restoration and the devil is behind desolation. And here's the picture of restoration. It's, it's very exciting. And I will restore to you the years that the locust has, e has eaten. Verse 25. And the canker worm and caterpillar and palmer worm my great army which I send among you. And you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God that hath dealt wondrously with you and my people shall never be ashamed. Isn't that exciting? What a wonderful God we had. We have. He's a God of abundance. He wants to see his people enjoy what? Abundance. Not sufficiency only, but over and above sufficiency. Uh, he wants our cup to f flow over so that we can say, my cup runneth over. Like, like, like it says there in the Psalms. And then finally, in verse 28, it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. What does that remind you of? Of Pentecost, exactly. And Peter, on the day of Pentecost, went back and he referred to this scripture. And he told those wondering Jews that were that couldn't believe what they were seeing, the multitude around, remember, they were in the upper room and they acted kind of weird and uh, they were staggering on their feet like they were what? Like they were had drunk uh, new wine. And uh, people were saying, my goodness, they must have, uh, they're under the influence. <laughs> Uh, they've been they've been hitting the bottle. What did Peter say? Oh no, it's not. It's too early for that. It's only nine o'clock in the morning. <laughs> People don't get drunk that early. It's something else. It's the new wine, spiritual wine from heaven. And he refers to this scripture. Imagine Peter, who was so dense during the earthly ministry of Christ, nothing registered in his mind that Jesus would say this. Suddenly, after the Holy Ghost came upon the twelve apostles. Everything registered in the Old Testament. They didn't have the New Testament, but the Old Testament. All the prophecies registered, bang, in one moment. They got a doctor's degree in divinity. <laughs> and imagine, all of a sudden, that he should jump to this scripture, just like that. Like he had sat down and, you know, did some word study that day. Well, maybe he did because they were in their upper room for how many days? Ten days. And, well, yeah, I take that back. They probably must have been studying the scriptures. And he said, oh, now I know what that means. Here it is. <laughs> and he says, you know, Joel. I mean, Joel, that's part of their Bible, the Jews. You knew Joel. I will pour out my spirit <coughs> upon all flesh. What does all flesh means? On all, all human beings. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your old men shall dream dreams, your, your young men shall see visions, and also upon the servants uh, uh, and upon the handmaids, in those days will I pour out my spirit. Isn't that beautiful? 
And so these words were fulfilled because immediately uh, the apostles began to prophesy, and they began to speak in tongues, and then those that were baptized that day, I think there were, what, 5,000 that were baptized? And they began to what manifest the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And they were prophesying and speaking in tongues and glorifying the Lord. So these words were literally fulfilled that day. But it also says, I will show wonders in the heavens, watch this, and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. What uh, Dr. Otto referred to this afternoon, the natural disasters, the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord come. So those uh, verse 30 and 31 were not fulfilled on the day of Pentecost. There were no natural disasters. So what does this indicate? This is very crucial here, because this is where most of our Orthodox people and theologians do not agree that there's going to be another outpouring of the Holy Spirit just before the return of Jesus. And at that time, there will be natural disasters just before, uh, after or before. And I will show wonders in the heavens and the earth, etc. So the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and ter awesome day of the Lord come. So, and then, um, remember, uh, Joel also said, uh, Rejoice, uh, for God has given you the former rain moderately, and you will, he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain. So there are two kinds of rains. What is rain there referred to? Symbolic for what? The outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Two rainfalls. One rainfall was on the day of Pentecost, and the second ra rainfall will be just prior to the return of Jesus. Now, officially in our church, this is not accepted. They say, well, we have only one Pentecost. <coughs> but my Bible shows that that there will not be another Pentecost, but there will be another outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Not a new one, but a fresh, a fresh one. I mean, you know, how can I put it? Uh, what? Resurgence. Resurgence, yes. Uh, why? Why does God provide for a latter day rain? Opsimus ietos What's the other Greek word? I forgot. Opsimus and. Uh, why, why this latter-day rain? Well, I mentioned it earlier. Because of what? Of the desolation that has stepped in since the mystery of iniquity? Work it! For 2,000 years, the mystery of iniquity. Satan has been doing his job. 2,000 years. And he's done a beautiful job. I mean, you know, the devil's done a good, good job. He's successful in getting the church into a state of what? Desolation. Spiritually withering on the vine. Where the gospel is not preached. Where lives are not changed. I'm not saying that we're blaspheming the name of Christ or we're cussing God. No. But in a very subtle way, in the name of, uh, of our religion, we are really what doing what? We are really putting Jesus in the background. And the Holy Spirit coming down is doing what? Restoring not only the believers, but he's restoring the sovereignty and lordship of the, of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's putting things back in the right place and right condition, just the way they were in the beginning, before the mystery of iniquity worked. In other words, God had to come down and correct these things before the coming of Jesus. Jesus was not, is not going to come back for a desolate bride, a withered uh, old hag. He's coming back to do what? To receive a beautiful bride. Not having wrinkle or what? Or spot or a blemish. Doesn't Paul say that in Ephesians chapter 5? that he's coming to receive a glorious church. Now, how can the church be glorious without the coming of the Holy Spirit again? Because in the meantime, the church has lost its what? Vitality, its vibrancy, 
it has fallen into apostasy, apostasia. Look at the Roman church today. I don't want to knock any churches. But I mean, the Roman church until a couple, about a decade ago, I mean, it was standing for the gospel, basically. Now, priests are denying everything. You name it. I mean, the nuns are going out in the streets. Demonstrating they're going crazy in behalf of abortion. They're pushing for abortion rights. They're pushing for homosexual rights. They're uh, pushing for for uh, ordination of women, ordination of lesbians, I mean, you name it. I mean, Tzalatikan. I mean, they're going crazy. They're going bananas. What's in a Roman church, which I used to admire at one time, think about, well, forget about the other denominations. If the Roman church has gone down the tubes, forget about the other Protestant denominations. So thank God, I mean, God has spared orthodoxy so far, but we're desolate also, again I repeat, because of the religious formalism that has sucked out, sapped out the, the spiritual vibrancy to such a degree where we persecute the, the champions of Christ. We're not interested in Christ anymore. We're interested in rules and regulations. Like I said earlier today, Paul said, I don't care why someone preaches Christ as long as pre Christ is preached whether in truth or in pretense. Eat in profasi, eat in alithia, he says there. Christos katagelete. Today, I mean, you have to have permission to preach Christ. You have to present your papers. I mean, they wreck you over the coals. So, gazun di psikia napodi. At any rate, this is very exciting that God is intervening. This is the, this is the key word, my beloved. Divine intervention. And I'm, I'm not saying this because this is, you know, nice theology. It's not theology for me, but it's actual experience. Because in 1972, I got a taste of this right here, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. I didn't know anything about it. I had the conventional provisions, okay, as a priest. You know, I was a very strict priest back then, morally, ethically, I mean, you know, I didn't break any moral rules, even though I was a young celibate. I could have done a lot of hanky-panky, and yet I was so miserable in all my righteousness, in my sinlessness, I was miserable. I was ready to throw in the towel to resign from the priesthood, I told you. I couldn't stand up and face a small group to talk to them. I'd blank out. I had. Uh, I was attacked. All the my everything. All my childhood weaknesses were coming out in me, since I was being threatened by my authority figures. You see, that was it. that was the supreme test. My my God was tossed off the pedestal. Do you see what I'm trying to say? Who was my God? It wasn't Jesus. It proved. It, it, it was proven to me. It was some archbishop or bishop that was my God. And the moment I felt the wrath of a bishop or archbishop, I was devastated. It was like I was under the sentence of condemnation and hellfire. I suffered pathologically from the spirit of rejection. Where I, I even though I was, I led a good life. Think of it. How, much, how the devil... See, I, I went through this stage of desolation. I was, I was a victim of this desolation. And I didn't see anything around me, no one that could come to help me, no fellow priest. I was on my knees day and night, and I was crying out to the Lord. I couldn't figure out what was wrong with me. What it was, I, 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 I didn't know anything about these... The, the workings of Satan in, in your emotional life. I thought de the devil, all the devil did was to make us morally corrupt. But I never knew the tactics of the devil in our emotional life, uh, Apollo. That was new to me. No one ever told me that he gets involved in our emotional life. Until my day came, the day of my restoration. Because I heard about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, some uh, convert priest under the, in the Antiochian jurisdiction, 
told me about his own experience of being baptized in the Spirit. I said, what's that? I never... I said, we got the sacraments, I said. What do we need? What is this? We were, bapt we were baptized. We were chrismated. We got it all. No, he said, uh, I was on the verge of taking my life, this priest said. Orthodox priest. <laughs> And he crossed all of his T's, dotted all of his I's, and crossed all of his T's in the liturgy. No one could have been a better celebrant of the liturgy than this priest, and, and who had re resorted to drink, to drinking. He had become an alcoholic to hold on to survival. Now you, you explain that to me. So it's, I don't want to get into the details. It's getting late, but this priest witnessed to me in the city of... of of uh, Huntington, West Virginia in 1972 and he came to visit me and he was an ex-student of mine from the seminary, a convert. So I had to humble myself to my ex-student, he witnessed to me. And he told me how the baptism of the Holy Spirit gave him survival and, and deliverance. And I, I went to his church, I, 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 I attended one of their prayer meetings and they laid hands on me to pray over me. and. And that was new to me. I never had lay people hand, lay hands on me. And, and that was a humbling experience, but I accepted it. I was confused. I didn't know what they were doing at that time. And I went back home from Huntington, West Virginia with only one effect, uh, after effect of that visit, a thirst for what they had. I saw something these people had I didn't have. You know what it was? Exuberance and joy in that congregation. There were... 98% were all charismatic, baptized in the Holy Spirit, and Orthodox, too. I said, Lord, I don't understand everything theologically about this, but I want what they have. I could have said, well, I'm a professor of theology. I have three degrees after my name. I'm not going to have them show me, you know, what to do. I could have done that. Couldn't I? How many priests are doing that today when I witnessed them? I could have done it very easily. I had all the cred cred academic cred credentials. But you know what it was? It was desperation. I said, it's a matter of survival for me. And the Lord came through after several months of waiting upon the Lord, travailing in travail, spiritual travail, waiting upon the Lord for this experience. I used to go around having people pray for me and over me and lay hands on me. I, I pulled down the barriers uh, interchurch barriers. They didn't mean as much as they as they used to. At one time, I wouldn't be caught dead praying with a Protestant. I mean, that was unthinkable for me. I had no use for non-orthodox. But now I found myself praying for Catholic Charismatics and Pentecostals. And what impressed me was their love for whom? The person of Jesus. I said, after all, every, after everything is said or done, what counts is what? The person of Jesus. And one day I received this ex experience in my, in my home alone. Uh, the Lord visited me suddenly in my dining room where I was having a lunch by myself. Just as I was ready to sit down, I was standing and praying uh, over my lunch. And suddenly the power of God invaded me suddenly, out of the blue, and filled me. And I began to weep and to sh shake. My whole body was just quivering and crying like I just discovered my father for the first time. Like, as if I was saying, where have you been? My precious dad, where have you been? I've been waiting to, to meet you. I never knew my father. I knew him theologically, but I never knew him, what, in my heart. That was the need I had as a priest, because I came out of a background, the Lord knew that my need, that my need, the emphasis here of restoration was in the area of love and acceptance. See how the Lord is, he, he sympathizes with us, he knows our individual needs. Somebody else might not have had that need, but I needed that need of acceptance. He knew the rejection spirit. It devastated me. Because I came from a background where everything was law and order, discipline, xilo, discipline. 
I used to be beaten by my father unnecessarily, physically. I mean, he'd take my head and hit it against the wall many times. Because of a bad marriage, he would take out his frustrations on us children. We were five children. His anger. I didn't know what affection was. I didn't know what love was. Some parents smother their children with affection, and that's wrong too. Well, I had the very opposite. My life was miserable as a child. It was one long punishment. And you know, in one sense, my cross never ended since childhood. To this day, my life is one of punishment since childhood. The Lord picked on a priest like myself who, who was a victim of extreme rejection and he appointed me for a crusading cause. I wasn't cut off for that. I had no qualifications for that, but what does the Word of God say? God chooses the weak things of this world. I said to the Lord one day, Lord, I said, I can think of many other priests who are stronger than I am. And to this day I bear a cross of rejection, my beloved, since childhood. No, the Lord took possession of my life. And he did not pamper me. Did you hear me? God does not pamper us. He did not pamper me in my weakness. He didn't say, oh, you suffered enough, if Savia, through your child. Now I'm going to give you all the love. The people will give you all the love and affection and support. Oh, they're going to think the world of you now. <laughs> Nothing of the kind. <laughs> that day never came. He never pampered me to this day. Now, I carry a cross of rejection. But now, I carry it with what? With pride. And I carry it with what else? What's the word? Joy. Can you rejoice in your rejection? I have learned to rejoice and to celebrate in my rejection. After 29 years, it's 30 years by the end of this year. If I had not learned to rejoice, I would have been in a straitjacket by now. In a mental hospital. But I'll tell you, I've never felt stronger and more secure. Why? Because of Jesus. So this picture of desolation and restoration is not theory, it's not lovely theology, but what is it? It's reality for me. It's experience. So I can identify with Joel's prophecy. I don't have anyone, I don't have to defend myself because the Lord invaded my life and he saved me, delivered me from disaster. The disaster that my family had brought upon my life almost at the verge of disaster. And not only my immediate family, but my larger family, the church that I loved, <clears throat> left me desolate and did not come to. Lift me up. And yet that church now I love and I'm consumed with a love for that church and I give my all for that church that never came to lift me up in my hour of need. Praise God. <coughs> so the baptism of the Holy Spirit is not something that we could speculate about but it's real my beloved and if I could receive it you could receive it too. We all, maybe you don't have the needs I had, the dramatic needs, the critical, crucial needs I had. You might not be all that desperate, but still you'll never make it without the latter day rain. Now how does that connect with the sacraments? Well, I don't have time tonight for that. You know, there's so much I can teach about in every session, in every conference. But I'm going to bring my message to a close so we could pray for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But all I know 
I know that I know in my spirit the, sh the Lord shows me that this is a special provision, extraordinary provision from heaven for the believer to do what? To cope with the mystery of iniquity in the last days. We'll never make it with the conventional religious means that we are acquainted with and familiar with. And you're looking at a priest that was a hardcore orthodox, fanatic, a legalist of the worst kind. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, it's, it's for, for real. It transformed my entire life in my ministry. In one moment, I was healed and delivered. In a moment, I got the package deal. All that garbage came out of me. And God replaced that garbage with his Holy Spirit and his love. And the capacity to be useful for other people and to be a blessing to other people. That's why God wants to bless us with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So that we may be vessels and instruments to reach others. To be more effective. Until that day I could not impact anybody's life. I couldn't even put a dent in anybody's life until that time. I used to give beautiful talks, lectures. People used to say, oh, I've learned more from you, Father, about my religion than any, anybody else. But that's all. It was all where? Up here. Nothing down here. But from the moment I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I began to impact lives and their hearts began to be changed. That's beautiful. And when I went to Greece soon after, I don't have time to get into that tonight, but I mean, we had miraculous healings that came in Greece in the public auditoriums that, that, that just blew my mind while they were seated, seated in their seats. People were getting healed from critical terminal diseases without my even laying, touching, even, touching them even. And that can happen even tonight here while you're listening to me. God's touching you now. His Holy Spirit is moving right here in this place. You don't have to wait to come up. But you've got to humble yourself and let Jesus take any garbage that's in you from your past like he did out of me. But when you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, then you have to be ready for trouble. So I thought I had trouble until I was baptized in the Holy Spirit. But when I was baptized in the Holy Spirit, then all hell broke loose against me. I mean, you have no idea. The fury, the wrath of the devil against me. Ooh! But thank God, it didn't bother me anymore. It was like d water off a duck's back. Isn't that something? I would smile in the, in the face of my attackers. I rejoiced in my sufferings then. Can you do that today? Can you rejoice in your sufferings? 